Because I don't want to, like, insinuate Stephen was lying, right? Well, <laughs> I, know I mean, that. I don't know if you do, I, but... <laughs> I, I think that it's misrepresented. Hey guys, in today's video, we're going to take the deepest dive ever, get to the bottom of the story once and for all, what happened between Jean LaBelle and Steven Seagal. We're going to basically break everything down. We're going to use logic and reason. I got a witness, the actual stunt coordinator, Conrad Palmasano with me. We're going to break every little thing down. We're going to talk about other things too, of like because he's worked with Steven Seagal so much, like does Steven Seagal actually hurt stuntmen? Uh, he's going to give some pretty cool behind-the-scenes stuff on Under Siege and then a pretty funny story on the NAACP on the set of Mark for Death. So all kinds of cool stuff. So a few years ago, I seen Steven Seagal doing an interview. It was like on an MMA show with Ariel Hawani. And of course, the, uh, you know, Gene LaBelle, Steven Seagal story came up. And when I first heard that, I was dumbfounded. And so was Conrad Palmazano, who you're welcome to go talk to. He was standing right there and he's probably the most famous stunt coordinator in, in our business and you know Vietnam veteran and a great salt of the earth, honest, upright, honorable, non-lying man. And Stephen Skull was telling him that you have to talk to a guy named Conrad Palmasano. He was a stunt coordinator. He's seen everything. He's a stand-up guy, honest guy. You got to talk to him. Because I could tell Stephen Skull didn't really – think that Ariel Hawani believed what Seagal was saying. Yeah, you know, what you should do if you if you don't believe me, and I'm pretty positive you do. I do, I do. Find Conrad Palmazano. I know you do. Then find Conrad Palmazano and let him call Conrad a liar, too. Now, with that said, Conrad, what I want to ask you is, has Ariel Hawani ever reached out to you to try to get the story? I have no idea even who he is. Then that, that I guess that's a no. So <laughs> I know. Enough. I have no idea who that guy is. That's interesting. And it kind of, I was kind of thinking he probably didn't because it kind of ties into that whole thing, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And I think people in the MMA community and just a lot of people in general just really love this story because for whatever reason, some people don't like Steven Seagal. So any story that like, you know, humiliates them in any way, they, they love whether it's true or not, but we want to yeah. set the record straight. I don't know why people want to throw stones at Stephen, right? It's just, when we were doing, uh, I think it was Out for Justice in New York, there were so many fans on the streets and hanging off phone poles and like that, we had to get the police on motorcycles to drive down the sidewalk to move the people back so we could film. That's how many people, and a little old lady come up, thank you, Stephen, for setting a goal for my children, somebody to follow. He was so big, and all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but you know, he fell off the edge of the earth and then everybody wanted to attack him. Yeah, so, it's really bizarre. That. It's really bizarre. I mean, I loved him growing up in the 90s watching him. Seagull was right up there with Stallone and Arnold and right. Van Damme. You know, he's one of my favorites as well. So this incident would have happened on Mark for Death. How did you even get involved with that project to begin with? Well, let me say that my producer friend, Peter McGregor Scott, who, bless his heart, is no longer with us, he brought me on. We did movies. We did movies then and before and after for, for decades, you know, he brought me on to the movie because I was a good uh, filmmaker. And when I first met Steven Seagal, you know, he was a, a, a huge martial arts star, right? With a couple movies under his belt. And I told him from on day one, I said, Steven, I'm not a martial artist. I don't know what you do. You do what you do. All I know is how to make you look good on film doing what you do. And that's my job is to make you work with the cameras and make things look good on film. That's what I'm here for, not to tell you how to fight. You know how to fight. And so that was the beginning of our relationship because I was just 100% honest with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then basically, how did uh, Jean LaBelle get involved in, in on the uh, film? <laughs> Jean LaBelle and I have been friends for decades, you know, before that. And, and uh, you know, we started working together sometime in the 70s. So I started hiring him on different shows. And uh, he was just one of those icons in the business, you know, had a great personality. He was big and he's tough. And when you need a bad guy to do stuff, you know, you call Gene because he looked like a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing uh, uh, Mark for Death, Stephen said that um, um, he was a big fan of Gina Bell's. And he said, I'd love to meet the guy, right? 
And I said, okay, great. And Gene and I were both members of the uh, Stuntman's Association. And I was at the Stuntman's office one day and he said, hey, if you ever get a chance, I got my quad runner. I need to rent it so I can write off my taxes for the year. If you get a chance to hire me to drive my car quad runner, I'd love to do that. And I said, well, I'm doing a little uh, foot chase sequence with Steven Seagal down this dirt road out in the, the valley. Uh, maybe you can come and we'll put a camera on the back and you can drive that and, you know, we'll rent it. He goes, oh, that's great. So I called him to do that and I told Steven, oh, Gene will be here tomorrow. And he goes, oh, great. I'd love to meet him. And when they showed up that morning, right, I knocked on Steven's trailer and uh, I said, oh, Gene LaBelle's here. You know, he'd like to meet you. So they come out and they shake hands and say hello. And Steven had like two bodyguards there with him because at that time, his star power, you know, they were concerned, even though we're out on a ranch in Mullen, no place, they were still there. And uh, uh, Stephen Lambert was there as well. And I said, excuse me, and I had to walk maybe uh, a half a block maximum from where his trail was down to look at the, the street where we're gonna do the chase. I'm standing there and I look up, I look north and I look south and they were standing east of me. And, um, you know, I could look over and I could see him over there talking, he and Gene, but wasn't paying much attention to it. And then uh, uh, Stephen Lambert comes running up and goes, hey, there's a, there's a problem with the two of them. And I turn around and go, really what? And I look over and Stephen is laughing and he's got his hand on Gene's shoulder and Gene's got his hand on Stephen's shoulder and Stephen slapped on the back and they're just laughing and going, ha, 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 And I go walking back over and I says, you know, we're ready to shoot. I said, Gene, go get the quad runner. Stephen, are ready to shoot your shot. And we walked to the street, Gene got on the quad runner and put the camera on the back. We shot like two or three takes and we're running down the street and he pushes the guy through a fence and say, thanks, Gene. He got the, on the quad runner, loaded up his truck, said goodbye and left. And that was that. So basically, Gene LaBelle was only there for like one day total, it sounds like. He wasn't even there for a day. He was there for maybe four hours maximum, right? And he was just, he wasn't hired as a stuntman. He was hired to drive his quad runner so he could rent it and write it off his taxes, right? And I think, I believe that, you know, uh, while they're talking, you know, uh, Gene says something, you know, if I, if I get behind anybody, I own them, something like that. And Steven says, show me. And these are two martial artists going, you know, it's just like, uh, say, well, let me show you something, give me a hand. You grab the hand. Now, did you twist my hand or did I hand it to you too, right? Yeah. And so they do some little thing, right? And I'm only guessing now, right? But I say that, you know, uh, uh, Gene gets behind Stephen and puts him in some kind of mock hold, not a real hold, but a mock hold, mm -hmm. right? Demonstration hold. And Stephen, when he kind of loves to do, he reaches around and slaps Gene in the balls. Sure, that's what they up, say, yeah. Right? <laughs> and they're laughing and they're going like, <laughs> okay, I got it, right? There's two martial arts artists playing with each other for a moment. But there was never anything violent. There was never anger. There was never anything that, you know that first of all just start with this do you think if somebody choked out the star of a movie especially at that level where steven was choked him out and it never made the news in los angeles that the studio never right you think why wasn't on cbs and nbc and what the six o'clock news if that happened right mm -hmm. and let alone the fact that he choked him out made him wet himself and or defecate and put him in the hospital that would be national news. Yeah, it totally anything, would. Some magazine in Japan, right? Some martial arts magazine. So, so it just, it it just the, the story just surfaced in Japan like the next day, just out of the blue. Yes. Right? Yeah. And I have a couple of theories. Um, I almost wonder if it had something to do with whatever, the martial arts magazine maybe they had a close association to Stephen Skull's like ex-wife and family. Cause I know he used to run a dojo uh, that his stepfather yeah. or his father-in-law owned. Right. Yeah, he was like the only Anglo-Saxon guy who did it in Japan, something like that. Yeah. Right? There, there had to be a specific reason why that martial arts magazine, Japan wanted to make him look bad. Now, I don't know if it had to do with, you know, broken ties and his family relationship. I don't know how they are, or there, there has to be something there to make him look for okay. them to want him to look bad. And, uh, I want to show you this that uh, I have this letter. Uh, oh, okay. From Gene LaBelle. Mm -hmm. From uh, the postmark is uh, 1991. And uh, he says he doesn't know why this happened. He doesn't know how this article appeared in the magazine, that he had nothing to do with it. And that um, 
And if when they posted these pictures of him fighting, right? This was in that magazine article in okay. Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, one of the pictures, he has his uh, head on the outside of the leg and the others on the inside. He says, see, even these things don't match. It's not working. It's not, let's see if I can read just a portion of this to you, you know, right? He said, I'd like to uh, thank you for being my friend for so many years. You are one of the good guys, right? I went to my three attorneys, and he names their names, but I won't, right? They all say to drop it or we'll go on for years, right? I wrote a note that the attorney said to me, you can't even say this, right? And he says that uh, Steven Seagal is a great martial artist. I like Steven Seagal. He's a good actor, a great martial artist, right? Mm-hmm. And um, he says, this uh, Kung Fu magazine, December 1991, Ultimate Warriors, did without me, without knowing that they wrote 10 pages on me and what they said, and it was too late. That's from Gene LaBelle himself to me. Interesting. Right? And then when, uh, when this came out, I called Gene, and I said, Gene, you know, you guys got to get together with Stephen and, and do some kind of press conference or something. Mm -hmm. And that's when he said, after he talked to his lawyers, that um, no, if we go on, it's just going to go on forever. My lawyers say, don't do it, right? And here's the thing that he wrote, and he, and he said, Gene, they say, I can't even say this. Even though Steven Seagal may be controversial and an easy target, I'm appalled that anyone would write anything demeaning about him. Seagal is a fine actor and a great martial artist from Gene LaBelle. Okay. And that's just the thing is, his lawyers say, don't even say that publicly because it's just going to cause more controversy interesting yeah and unfortunately the controversy has not died right people are still talking about it all the time oh my god let me uh, years later right yeah and now, let me ask you this right if you look at my resume you see how many movies i did with steven seagal after this incident right? yeah you did out for justice uh under siege under on deadly siege. ground okay. so he kept hiring you obviously just so logical sense he thought it was my fault that this horrible thing happened to him to ruin his reputation. Would he keep on hiring me or does that prove he's a nice guy? Yeah, he would absolutely not hire you, <laughs> right. but he kept hiring you. So yeah. that's, you know, and I have to say in his favor, when people want to talk, is it real? Is it not real? Just look at that alone. Right. Yeah. Just, just that fact. You and I are still friends. We talk on the phone every once in a while. I call him on his birthday. He calls me on my birthday and he's living in Russia now, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. But he'll call me from over there and say hello and so on and so forth and wish me happy birthday. And, um, you know, uh, could he be difficult to work with at times? Yeah, not so much for me. And they, they say that uh, Gene LaBelle said, uh, oh, he did this because uh, Stephen was hurting stunt people. All lies and false propaganda. That's that rumor out there. Yeah. Part of his reputation didn't even have, didn't happen until after Mark for Death. There was no reputation of him doing anything against some people, right? At the time that we did that movie. And even when we did Under Siege, the studio um, in one week said, well, we need another action sequence, so design something for Steven. So we're on the, the ship, right? And they have a, a mechanics room. There are skill saws and all kinds of stuff like that in there. And so I bring his stunt team in. Now, mind you, he had his own stunt team. It was with him for years, right? Yeah, sure. And if they were like getting hurt all the time, would they stay with him for years? No, right? You wouldn't think so. so. Had his own stunt team. And Stephen comes walking on the set, right? And he comes down and he goes, he sees his guys around. He goes, all right, Connie, what's going on? And I said, well, Stephen, you know, the studio asked for another action sequence. We thought, well, you're on your way back to the, to the, wherever he was going, right? To the bridge. You could come through here and then we stage a fight. So here's what we thought we could do this and do that. He says, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, what would you do? Well, I take this guy and I do this. Oh, I go, well, what would you do that guy? Well, I take this guy and I do that. I said, well, what about these other guys? Well, I do this and I do this and I do this. So literally in, in five minutes, we choreographed the fight sequence, right? Mm -hmm. And he says to me, he says, okay, get this place padded. When it's all padded, call me. I'll be in my trailer, come back, and we'll shoot it. Well, he was in a place padded for the stunt people. He wasn't falling down. They were. But he didn't want to shoot the sequence until the place was protecting the stunt people. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, too. Um... Because even in one of his earlier films, Hard to Kill, like when he does that famous uh, liquor store scene, right? right? You can literally see the crash mats on the floor. 
Like they, yeah. I, you think they would paint it to match the floor, but they didn't. But anyway, there's these black crash mats on the floor. So you cover them up yeah, with a rug is, or something. Yeah. Yeah, he is protecting these guys. But here's a question, Conrad. So you worked on a lot of his bigger films. Outside of like your experience with him trying to help these guys, you know, uh, have less impact on these falls with those crash mats. Have you seen him hurt any stuntmen though? Because you you work with them a lot. Well, let me say this: that I told my stunt people when they're coming in. You know, on some days you play touch football and other days you play tackle. Mm -hmm. When you're coming in with Steven Seagal, you're playing tackle. So pad up. You're going to hit the ground hard. He's going to throw you hard. This is going to happen. But when you're doing horse falls and getting shot up horses and hitting the ground, you're hitting the ground hard. Sure. Much harder than Steven Seagal would hit you <laughs> or knock you, yeah. you know. That's now, could point. something happen from time to time and somebody get like a little TKO? Yeah. And at the same time, when we were doing, um, I think it was uh, Out for Justice, right, that I had his uh, son team in, and um, they were mostly Asians, mm -hmm. and um, I had him painted down black because he was fighting. Well, this would have been Mark for Death, not not Out for Justice. Mark for Death with the Jamaican Mark for Death, yes. Yeah. Mark for Death, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so somebody called the NAACP on me, right? And uh, so the NAACP shows up on the set. And they said, you got these guys. I said, well, first of all, they're minorities, right? But you have to be painting them down. I said, all right, send in the other set of doubles. So the other six guys come in dressed exactly the same. And I said, so here's the deal. When these guys are rushing at Steven Seagal and he's doing these tight wrist throws and like that, I'm using these guys because they know what to do to do the wrist fall and do the flip and hit the ground. But when he picks the guy up off the ground and throws him over the counter and into the wall, that's the black stump guy. Right, and I said, Blacks in front of them. I said, Do you guys want to do these stress falls? They go, No, I don't want to. I said, Okay, I got two sets of minorities doubling one set of actors. You know, what's your problem? Right, yeah. and they left. But, but that was it, too. It's it just like I knew that to help protect my son people when you're doing these really tight, twisty flips and like that, that I would have his guys who know exactly that style of martial arts and know how to deal with it. But then when they're actually doing a stunt stunt and just being thrown into something or hit by the car, then I'd have my own stunt people do it. So I used his team. Yeah. That's kind of a funny that, story. That's how that. we protect our actors from injuring stunt people by knowing who to put where. It's just like, you know, you don't put some uh, amateur actor in a car to do a, a scene where it runs over a stunt person. Yeah. So instead of doing 12 miles an hour, you're doing 22 miles an hour and you get somebody injured. So that's where the stunt coordinator is responsible for ensuring that stunt people aren't injured. Now, can you get injured doing stunts? Sure, it happens, right? Something goes a little awry, whatever like that. I've broken some ribs and collapsed the lung, but it wasn't anybody's fault other than I just took a bad bounce. Yeah, no, it's kind of funny that the, you know somebody called the NAACP, they got involved because they think they're trying to help like the black stuntmen, right? But it's like, they're like, no, you're really not helping. We let the Asian guy do it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah, slam me into the wall, but I don't want to do that wrist throw, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, it's so easy to, to twist a wrist or break a wrist or break a couple fingers when you're doing. Because you know, with Steven, you did it at speed. Oh yeah, that's that. Yeah. That's why we love these movies because you you could watch and study and appreciate the Aikido technique because he's doing it like for real. You know. <laughs> And I said, I went on, you know, Stephen went on to hire me. I went on to hire Gene LaBelle. I went on to hire Stephen Lambert for several shows, you know. And you look at Stephen Lambert's career and, you know, I guess, what, 2016, he fell off the charts. Mm. Do, do you know why, out of curiosity? Was he just getting too up, uh, up there in age? Or? I, I don't know. Um, he was always somewhat difficult to work with. He always had some kind of moody attitude for the most part. He could be a great guy too. I mean, he used to come to my house. We'd go work out every day. We'd go jog, you know, for five miles up to the up to the gym, do our workouts, and jog back to the house. We did that for you know for years, and so we were we were good friends. And and uh, why this uh, whole thing happened, and why he continues to to make that. I saw the one interview. We were saying I wasn't there, and when he told me there was a problem, I ignored him. Right? It was a problem with Stephen, right? Really yeah, he, yeah. You initially brushed him off, and then and yeah, then, then I brushed like yeah. really trying to get your attention to like, oh, you gotta see this. Look what's going on. I was scared that something else was gonna go on, so I ran to get the stunt coordinator, Conrad Palzano, and he was busy with with a uh, 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 camera, setting camera. So I'm in back of him, and he had producers, directors, the DP, 
everybody listening to him. So I'm in back and I'm waiting for the right moment, you know, because you can't just barge in. You don't want people to know. You don't want to make a big thing out of this, right? So I go in back of him, wait for the right moment. And I kind of lean to his ear and I said, Conrad, I said, uh, there's a confrontation with Seagal and LaBelle at base camp. You know, you better get over here and break it up. Well, he didn't understand what I was saying, so he ignored me. And it could have been, and I don't know because I don't remember specifically because it was no big deal at the time, right? But it could have been when he goes, oh, Gene and Steven, and I look over and they're hanging on to each other and laughing and slapping each other on the back. I went like, relax, man, they're fine. And I'm just looking and he's continuing with his camera work. So I walk away, kind of hesitant, five, 10 feet away, and all of a sudden he pops up and he realizes what's going on. But they were in my vision, right? And, I, and it could have been that he said, oh, you gotta do something. I look over and go, they're laughing. I go, Steve, they're fine, don't worry about it. He goes, no man, you gotta call me. I'm just guessing, because I have no particular memory of the occasion, because nothing happened. There's no reason to remember on that day what I had for breakfast either. And he runs over there and he yells to LaBelle before he even gets over there. You know, he's like 40 feet away. And hey, LaBelle, get back to your trailer. And LaBelle looks at him and goes to his trailer, right? Back to his trailer. And that was the end of that. There's another really important detail though that you had told me before on the phone that we, I think we need to talk about. Uh, basically, so it was that scene in the movie where he's in Columbia, he's running down the dirt road. So basically the ground is dirt. He had that entire outfit that was all black. Yes. So essentially if he fell on the ground, it would be very obvious. He'd be very, you know, his outfit would be very- When dirty. he came out of his trailer, he was already dressed in his black outfit, mm -hmm. right? And when he and Gene were talking, when they were doing this, they were standing in the dirt. It was, it, it's out on a Western movie ranch in Santa Clarita, right? Yes. There's no pavement around there any place. Once you turn off the main highway, you drive up a dirt road to get to the set, you know? So they're standing on the dirt. Had he been put down in the dirt, he would have, had he been sat down hard or anything, he would have had dirt all over his backside, the back of his legs, on his knees, whatever. But there was nothing like that. And you can't just dust dirt off with your hand and go, okay, let's go to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, you know, it's just like, and why this thing happened, you, you know, what well, was a couple of years later that it finally got out, you know? I think the movie was in 89 and this came out in 91, December of 91, something like that. So I don't remember quite the exact time span between when it's supposed to have happened. And it said the next day. But here's something interesting. So it's funny how so many people get the story details mixed, right? Like forever people were saying it happened on Out for Justice. And then, you know, people were saying, no, actually it was marked for death. But if he had that whole black outfit on in the dirt road, it was definitely... Yeah marked for death i actually even ended up making one of those mandela effect videos because of it you know like so people are just mixing up details and then you hear people will say he actually got choked out twice there were two incidences hey, but you're saying yeah that's funny you're saying labelle was only there for four hours so i don't know how he would have choked seagull out twice in the span of four hours right <laughs> just, yeah it seems and crazy. Had he been choked out once you don't think the production company would get him off the set and get rid of him? Had he even choked him out the first time, right? The yeah, yeah. Go, oh, oh, it's okay. It's only Steven Skull. He's only a star of our movie. He just got choked out. And, and we got to keep, we can't film today. We'll come back tomorrow. What? Right? $250,000 it would cost them to shut the, the set down for a day. And so the rumors of choking him out, going to the hospital and, right? It's just yeah and then for whatever so reason conrad like the, the rumor does spread throughout like the stunt world where you even have like comedian uh kevin hart will will tell the story the guy <laughs> choked the shit out of steven seagal <laughs> he's marked for death you know he'll say oh this stuntman told me about this incident so with that said because you worked on so many films and tv shows obviously a ton that have no relation to steven seagal have you heard like stunt guys bringing that story up and talking about it like any on any of the sets on the other projects you were on? Not for 20 odd years. I heard it a few times and of course I'll shut it down. But, sure. you know, I've been at the, um, at the local uh, restaurant bar for a happy hour and grabbing a meal. And two people aren't even in the industry sitting next to me start talking about it. Not even in the industry. 
right? And he yeah. Goes, hey, oh, and wait a minute. Said, How would you know? I said, well, it was my show before I did it happen. Yeah, you, you were there. Look here's IMDb. Look it up for yourself, right? And it, so it's amazing that, and I don't know why Stephen is such a target for people who want to throw mud balls at him, right? Yeah, there's know. various reasons. You know, it's, I think because he speaks his mind and he seems to lean more on the conservative side, which puts a target on your back, just that alone. In Hollywood, you know? sure, yeah. But, uh, you kind of think maybe Gene LaBelle himself leaked the story out to the Japanese press, right? Was that one of your theories? Well, I, I mean, it's certainly a possibility because who did the story benefit, right? Yeah. You start with that. And then how to get to a martial arts thing. Now, the only thing that makes me deter from that is this letter that I got, handwritten letter from Gene, mm -hmm. saying that um, they printed this thing without his knowledge. And even the pictures they showed of what he was doing was incorrect of what they were saying and writing about him, right? And they did 10 pages on him. And um, I know Gene, and um, I wouldn't want to call him a liar, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, so it makes me kind of step back from, oh, Gene must have leaked it, as opposed to somebody else who may have been on the set or knew the two of them or something did it in order to take a shot at Steven. I, that's what I think happened, because if I think about it logically, even though it would make Gene, he's like already well known as a badass, right? And obviously, yeah. if you're the guy that choked out Steven Skull, who was invincible, seemed invincible at that time, I guess you're even more of a badass. But the reason why I don't think he would have spread it, he would literally kill his livelihood. Like, forget about his reputation. Think about it. If you're going around saying you choked out the star of a movie, how the hell would you ever work again? Like, nobody would hire you. It just, that part doesn't make sense to me. That's why I don't think he necessarily spread it. Well, I think that that's probably true as well, right? And I don't believe that it's part of Gene's integrity to, uh, to be that person, you know? And I've never, ever, in all the interviews, and I've seen him, people ask him about it. He's never, ever said that he choked out Steven Seagal, ever. Yeah, he won't say it. He will kind of have the guy interviewing him kind of bring it up. And then he will give that response where it, you know, saying it without saying it in a way. It's very, it's very, yeah, uh, exactly, you know, right? smart. Well, if a guy soils himself, you can't criticize him. Because if they just had a nice big dinner an hour before, you might have a tendency to do that. Hey, you know, if a guy eats uh, so much food, he's got to do something with the food eventually. And you would well, say that's like another that, right? thing. That's another thing I don't buy. So, you know, my wife works in the uh, healthcare field, right? And, right. you know, like in the, in the trauma ward, obviously people are getting knocked unconscious in car accidents, doing all this. But nobody's like... She said it's very rare where somebody just like craps or pisses and stuff. Well, yes. It's mm -hmm. very rare. Think about it. We would all wake up in our own feces when we got up from a night's sleep, if that were the case. Yeah. Like your body, if you die, it, it will happen. But in general, if you're still alive, even if you get choked out and, or knocked out, you're not again, just going to relieve yourself. If that happened and Steven Seagal spoiled his costume, he would have to go in and the wardrobe people would have to bring him another change of costumes, sure. right? and do something within the dirty costume, so on and so forth. And again, had the production company heard of that, okay? Would I be even welcome the next day? You brought a guy and choked our actor out, what's the matter, you're fired, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that never happened. I continued working for the same people for years, right? And so let's sort of say, you know, you believe if, if as a stunt coordinator, I brought somebody in and he choked out the star of your movie, Right, you go, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we just <laughs> not a big deal. No, <laughs> sure. big deal. Brush right? that off. It's not a big yeah. deal. And again, why wasn't it on the six o'clock news? If Steven Seagal was choked out and there were witnesses, people would be calling news. You know, anytime there's a set accident, you hear about it in 20 minutes on the news. Mm -hmm. Person injured on the set of blah 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 blah. Car went off the road and hit a phone pole on the set of blah blah blah. You know? Yeah, I think the real question is that should be asked is how and why did this story slash rumor even like come about? That's like the real question. That's the real mystery. Cause we, we can speculate and have theories, but that's like the real question in my opinion. Not it's again, I don't know why they want to take this guy and knock him off the pedestal. 
because he was, like I said, he was so revered and such a huge star at that time. Even after that movie, when we were in New York doing the next one, well, I'd say there were hundreds of people on the sidewalks and hanging around. We had to get the police to move people out of the way and they're going up saying, oh, Mrs. Gall, can I have, right? And he'd go out there and sign autographs and be nice to the people and like that. There were little kids and old ladies and it was just like, well, at what point did all of a sudden it was okay to make him a, a bad guy, right? And something happened. Yeah, it was interesting. And people enjoy beating up Steven Seagal these days, not physically, but emotionally and in the press and whatever. And this story is going on for 30 years, right? And you know what the funny thing is, because I, I have a lot of different Steven Seagal related videos on my channel. And, you know, I'll have new people to the channel that will comment on those videos and they'll, they'll, they'll just say, oh, well, you know, he crapped his pants because of Gene LaBelle. And they always got a comment like, you might think that, but there's a lot more to the story. It didn't necessarily occur the way you've been told. Yeah. So people still think that all the time, even when they're just commenting on a video that has nothing to do with Gene LaBelle, but it's just like a Seagal related video. Yeah. And one guy, real quick, Conrad, one guy even told me after I told him that didn't happen. Here's why. And look at this video. He said, and, and I think this is a problem. And this kind of speaks to, you know, people in general, the psychology of people. He said, well, I still want to believe that story. So I'm going to go with that. That, I mean, we can't do anything about that with that type, right? And I say there's, there's, uh, there's no fixing that way. People want to believe the story. And I can't tell you how many interviews I've done, how many times I've been asked about it in public and, and on different news things and like that. And I've said many times the same story. It never happened the way that it put out there like that. And it said, Gene Bell went on to work for me and had he choked out the star of my show, would I hire him on another movie? He'd be blacklisted. No. Like nobody would be able to hire him. Like he'd just be too much of a risk. And even when the rumor's out there, people going, the rumor's not true, and they give Gene the benefit of the doubt and still hire him, right? Because he went on and made a lot of movies after that, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. But so one thing, though, that um, for whatever reason, like you'll have people like Joe Rogan or Ronda Rousey, and there's other like, uh, you know, MMA fighters that will literally say, they'll recount the story and they will literally say, Gene told me this story. Yeah, that's a true story. Yeah. That's an absolute true story. Yeah, Gene LaBelle told me that story. So I don't know if how those conversations went, obviously neither one of us were there, but I wonder if they're like goading him into saying it. And because he likes the idea of the story, he kind of feeds into it. Or if he just like brings it up himself, it's hard to say. But like you said, he hasn't publicly gone in an interview and said, yes, I choked out Stephen Scully crap himself. But if you go with Rogan, these people, for whatever reason, it's, it's seemingly he's telling that story in private conversations. And let me tell you this, you know, Steven Seagal had two bodyguards standing outside his trailer, right? Mm -hmm. So this all happened in front of the bodyguards. Yeah, they're not very the good bodyguards. bodyguards <laughs> would stand there and do nothing, right? Yeah. And they at least grab a hold of Gene and escort him away or do something, right? He's got two hired bodyguards standing outside his trailer like this, waiting, watching, make sure everything's fine. Why would they do something? I see when you look at the actual facts of what was going on, it's just impossible to believe that it ever happened the way that it's put out there, right? Yeah, and, and just to play devil's advocate, like let, let hypothetically, if it happened, you have to ask yourself, why would they let Gene still record that scene on his like forerunner? Like he would be kicked off, but he still shot that scene, yes. right? Yeah. So there, there's more evidence as far as like, it logically just doesn't make sense of that story being true. So it was just like, I, I looked on IMDB and uh, Gene LaBelle has a, uh, said he's listed as a stunt person on the set, but it says uncredited along with his son, David. Okay. Right? Yeah. And he's uncredited because he wasn't hired as a stunt person. But yeah, whoever yeah. put him on there could have done it himself. People do that, but you're not listed in the credits. You can add your name to the IMDb, you know, mm -hmm. you know how that goes, right? Sure. Yeah, people so, do that and then no, there's, people take it off it, and police it. it uncredited. <laughs> and I've heard stories of, oh, he was hired as the stunt coordinator and then he got fired because of it. Was, no, no, I was the stunt you're coordinator. You're the stunt coordinator. Yeah, yeah. that's. From day one, there was never, right? Yeah, yeah, there's just too many things that it, it just doesn't make sense for that to actually happen.
And like you said, you work with Steven, you work with Gene afterwards, you even work with Steven Lambert. I, I do got to ask you one thing, though. So Stephen Lambert's account of the story, and I know you said you didn't read his book, but, you know, I covered it in my video. So, I mean, why do you think Stephen Lambert, did he perceive something a little rougher than what actually took place, maybe? Because his story at least makes Stephen look better as far as not defecating himself, but that there was still like an incident. I mean, like, if I told you, if I spread my legs and I said, hit me in a crotch with your forearm, as hard as you can. And that's what, that's what Seagal did. And LaBelle jumped up like three feet in the air. And I see LaBelle's face. And, and it's literally three feet in the air. And the moment his toes touched the ground, he just sidestepped and spun his hand around the front of uh, Seagal's neck and took his leg and put it in back of uh, Seagal's feet and just threw his arm back and threw his leg forward, the bell that is, yeah. and Seagal went flying up. See the way my arms are? About four feet high and landed right on his butt and back, hard. Ouch. Uh, where he did go down, he wasn't choked out or anything, but you know, he took a, a bit of a tumble. So I don't know. It, it, I don't know how he perceived it. If he just thought it was more rough housing than, than you thought it was or what? Cause I don't want to like insinuate Steven was lying. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if you do, but <laughs> I, I think that it's misrepresented by Steven on what happened and the drama of it. And in his book, he calls me a liar. Right. I, I mean, I got to reread the chapter. I don't know if he used that exact terminology, but maybe I, I got to reread the uh, the chapter. I just, you know, responding to an interview, I saw that he was promoting his book. Right. And in that interview, he says in his book, he calls me a liar because I'm lying about the incident and so on and so forth. And let's go to the videotape. Okay, so, yeah, there was there was two bodyguards, which was Steven Seagal's. It was Steven Seagal, it was Gene LaBelle, there was uh, Lincoln Simon, who was stunt guy, uh, who was with me in my honey wagon and myself. So there was six, guys, six people there. Okay. Conrad, nobody else. There was no Conrad Palmazano, nobody else. Anybody who says otherwise about this story are liars. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, because they weren't there. The producers, the directors, whoever. Only the six were there. Nobody else saw. And did they have some physical contact? And again, they're saying, hey, you know, let me show you this move I got. Okay, go, I can get out of that. Go ahead. No, you do this. Boom. You know, hey, don't do that to me. But it was just like, it was done in, in fun and in jest. And it's just like two professionals kind of, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, they're exchanging martial art technique and knowledge. But I think, you know, going to Stephen's book, if I remember right, there, you know, he talks quite a bit about this incident. And I think he said he had you, uh, Stephen Seagal and himself were basically going to set the record straight, right? Do like an interview. And I think yeah. it got recorded somewhere, maybe even twice, two separate occasions. Yeah. But then again, this is according to Stephen. I'm not saying he's lying or he's not. But just going with the book, he said it kind of seemed like you and Seagull wanted to badmouth Gene and wanted him to badmouth Gene, but he didn't want to badmouth Gene. And then the whole little interview between you guys just kind of like was never released. So, but you're saying you're still actually friends with Gene LaBelle. So you yeah. wouldn't necessarily have any reason to badmouth him or Steven Seagull. None whatsoever. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I still call Gene on his birthday. He calls me on mine. It, you know, it's just like, uh, of course, he's getting up there in age. Now oh, yeah, he's got to be like 90. Off now, a bit, you know, and he's not taking work anymore and like that. But, you know, he was definitely an icon in the business without question. And um, and Stephen Lambert's interpretation of what happened that day or what he remembers of it is just very different than mine. Mm -hmm. Right? And that um, I don't need to lie about it because if it actually happened, why wouldn't I say 
Oh, Gene DeVille choked him out. <laughs> Why wouldn't I say that if it was true? I can't say it because it wasn't true, and that's not what happened. Right? Did they have a little physical contact? But yeah, again, it was two martial artists exchanging, you know, holds and moves. Well, if you put me like that, I do this. Well, if you do that, I do this. You know, and it was just like, and then immediately I said, "Hey guys, it's time to go to work. Let's go." And we did the shots. And Gene loaded up the thing, and he left. It was like it was the first uh, shot of the morning with Gene, uh, uh, with Stephen running down the street with Gene driving a quad runner. Right? And we did that, and we had a, uh, he goes into a saloon, and there's a big bar fight that we do inside there. It was all after work the whole rest of the day, and there was never any issue. There was never any Yeah, any like basically no animosity between them when they shot that scene. Gene just packed up and left, it sounds like. everything. Everybody exactly. was cool. There was nothing like that, nor was there anything between Stevens and all going, hey, man, you brought this guy to my set, and you let him do this to me. What's the matter with you, right? There was never anything like that. There was never, Stephen never said, wow, that Gene, he's a weird guy. Nothing. Right. Oh, let me ask you this, Conrad, because it, this is another detail that people like are all over the place. Like some people say, oh, there were six witnesses. And then someone else was like, oh, there were over 20 guys seeing, you know, this Gene LaBelle single thing. Like how many, I, I, you know, you may not have the exact number in your head, but like approximately how many people were like were around that would have even seen their interaction? I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. I know that, um, Stephen Lambert was there. Stephen Seagal was there. Gene LaBelle was there. The, two the two bodyguards. bodyguards was there. Was right? Lincoln Simons there? That's the other stunt guy Stephen Lambert said was there, a guy named Lincoln Simons. He might have been there. Okay, he, that's not someone you're that familiar with? I think with? he was on the set that day, but whether he was actually there at that moment or okay. not, okay, I don't know. Because Lincoln has never ever said anything publicly or privately that I know of about. This I had tried to call him, by the way. I actually got his number from someone, but he, he never got back to me. I was really trying to dig deep into this story, you know. <laughs> yeah. So there you guys have it. As far as the Stephen Skull Gene LaBelle story goes, we can finally put it to rest. Fuck you and die. <laughs> we logically dissected and analyzed it. Nothing happened. Simply put, an interaction between the two men got blown way out of proportion and became the stuff of urban legend. But a question remains, what was the real motivation behind wanting to make Steven Seagal look bad? You never know. 